Hello, my name is Tamar Friedman, Director of Peer Programs at Jewish Funders Network. And on behalf of JFN, I am happy to welcome you to today's webinar on exploring the challenges and opportunities of affordable housing. This webinar is part of programs hosted by the National Affinity Group on Jewish Poverty. The National Affinity Group on Jewish Poverty is a collaborative of funders, Jewish Federation, direct service providers, researchers, media outlets, and advocates dedicated to fighting poverty in the American Jewish community. Many of you have joined us on other programs, and I've also noticed we have some new people. We are so glad to see all of you. And wanted I also wanted to mention that starting in January, we'll be hosting a new series of programs and more to come in the, in the next few weeks with dates and topics on that, but look out for in your email for all that information. I will now hand it over to our moderator, Susan Ditkoff of the Bridgeman Group Boston, who will, who will frame the conversation and introduce today's speakers. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, Tamar. Welcome, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. I think this is our 10th webinar in the series. It's a pleasure to um, put these together as we explore the disproportionate impact that the COVID-19 crisis has had on populations who are already struggling, already underserved. Um, and so today is just an absolutely critical piece in that puzzle, some say the foundational piece, um, which is housing. Um, so in this moment, um, our topic is, is incredibly relevant, more relevant than ever. Um, and we are fortunate to have just an all-star lineup of people um, to, to learn with. Uh, the purpose of these webinars is to really highlight wisdom from different camera angles, um, directly from people who are engaged um, in the work uh, from, again, various, various vantage points. Um, so I'd like to first just start by introducing uh, the people that we have today. Um, we'll go around and make a couple of introductory remarks um, and have a bit of a conversation. If you have questions, please do put them into the chat and we'll get to as many of them as we can. Uh, and then we'll wrap up at the top of the hour. Uh, so to get us started, um, I'd like to introduce um, Ruben Rotman, who is the CEO of the president and CEO of the Network of Jewish Human Services Agencies. Um, Eddie Lauren, the CEO and founder of Strategic Realty Holdings. Lisa Budlow, the CEO of High Baltimore and the, and the chair of the housing subcommittee of the Affinity Group. Jenny Schaff, the CEO of JFS Rochester, and Jane Lauren, executive director and co-founder in Foundation. So thank you all for joining us. Um, Ruben, I'd love to start it off with you uh, to kind of give us your big picture observations um, from a national level. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. And thank you to everybody, to, to Jenny, Lisa, Jane, and Eddie for joining for this conversation and for all of you who have logged on today. This is a topic that for many, um, the, your first reaction is, Housing is so huge, it's so overwhelming, the need is so pressing, there's no way to make an impact. And for many, many, many years, historically, the social service field, the human service field has really functioned in silos with direct service providers at one end, assisting individuals with a range of needs and housing providers at another end, Pre frankly, serving as landlords and managing, developing and managing property. It, it, it is the rare situation where those two silos talk to each other and where those two silos come together to develop meaningful uh, responses. And I, I want to acknowledge the work of the Affinity Group because right from the beginning, it decided to create a housing subgroup. And Lisa Budlow as CEO of High Baltimore really serves in that role of facilitating dialogue and conversations about what is this housing agenda all about and how can social service providers and housing providers and developers find ways to work, to to work together um, to address the challenges. And so in my role, supporting a network of social service providers in the network of Jewish human service agencies. Um, we always have dialogue about the need for housing, section eight lists which are closed or, or you just can't access, and the role that staff and the agencies play to help people navigate what the affordable housing options are and how to keep a roof over their head. <clears throat> and I learned along the way 
of a model that was developed by JFS Rochester recently that seemed to bring those worlds together. And in dialogue with Jenny at JFS Rochester, I learned that she found um, very helpful partners in Jane and Eddie with each of their respective hats. And so I started a conversation with Jenny, with Jane, with Eddie, and also with Lisa, and said, you know what? This is a conversation that we need to share with others. There is so much here that we need to unpack together. And so the purpose of today is to simply introduce you to a variety of, of perspectives on this very daunting topic. The perspective of a funder, the perspective of a real estate developer, the perspective of a social service agency executive, and together, perhaps we can spark some creativity and some further dialogue to advance Jewish communal responses to those in need, because frankly, the Jewish community is not immune to the issue of housing affordability. Um, and as Susan, as you opened, the COVID pandemic has really accelerated our understanding that housing insecurity is a significant challenge on par with food insecurity. And if we don't talk about the two hand in hand, we're not really addressing challenges today. So those are my framing thoughts for why we're here today and the roles that each of these, each of, each of my colleagues will begin to talk through. Terrific. Um, thank you for those opening remarks. Um, Eddie, we'd love to start with you, just hear a little bit more about, as you think about sort of the role of uh, developers and sponsors of affordable housing, um, how it works from a business point of view, but also what it means to really partner effectively. Hello and welcome to everybody. I'm very happy to tell you a quick story because I think it's fun. I wrote an article about Tikkun Olam, Repairing the World Affordable Housing and Programming and Services, and that article got published. And lo and behold, I get a call from Jenny, who is at Rochester, and asks about affordable housing and was intrigued at how she could get involved and try to do something in Rochester. I said, Imagine that we actually own 500 units, mostly um, a lot of seniors in Rochester, right in the heart of the city, across from Costco, and we'd love to do a pilot. So we talked about how does it get funded, and Jenny was uh, fortuitous enough and, and, and ingenuitive enough, that's a word, to go find the money from one of the foundations locally, and we come up with a program that she's going to talk about, but I thought that was a really good way to start out is how we all came together and how exciting it's been, uh, even through COVID trying to maneuver this unique opportunity. The bottom line is you can get, have a YMCA or synagogue or church, or you can get people where they live on their doorsteps. We have a fabulous 500 unit property with about 1500 unit, you know, residents to serve. So you can do it right in the clubhouse right where they live. So this is a unique opportunity and uh, I'll leave it at that for now. Great, thank you. That's a great opening for us. Lisa, tell us um, about what it looks like in Baltimore. Great, thank you so much and um, good afternoon to everyone. I think good morning to Eddie and Jane and everybody else on the West Coast. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. So I'm Lisa Budlow, the CEO of Hi. Um, Hi is a local, um, human service agency in the Jewish community in Northwest Baltimore. Uh, we work in housing development and in, in uh, community development as well. So, um, you know, as, as um, was mentioned, I also serve, I have the honor of serving as the chair of the um, housing work group of the um, uh, Jewish Funders Network uh, National Poverty Affinity Group. And so I wanna sort of address my remarks kind of from both angles. Um, and, and I guess I want to start with the funder brief that was recent, recently published. Um, it, it really kind, kind of began its work in conversation within the work group. Um, and then there was some kind of additional research and the, and the um, brief was put together as an overview. You know, as we mentioned, it's, um, I think Ruben said, it's housing can seem really daunting. Um, and so this was kind of a way to put some headlines together of how um, agencies and funders might get involved if they're interested in getting involved. And there were some um, key highlights that I wanna talk about. So um, one, providing more affordable housing, um, a critical need. Uh, two, 
um, uh, working in, in home repair and modification, so the homes that are already existing. Three, housing counseling, um, so really kind of working um, to help keep people in their homes. And four, advocacy, um, especially around a certain a few areas that I'll talk about, and, and just kind of generally the brief um, points out how um, what we've learned in the pandemic, um, as important as housing, you know, always was, it really always was, uh, it is just um, really highlighted as of critical importance to have safe housing, and, and it really it, it rises to the level of being an equity issue. So I'm going to briefly go through, if that's okay, just um, a few of those areas. So um, affordable housing. Um, so Chai is a um, housing developer. We have developed and we own 1,600 units of affordable senior housing, um, and we're continuing to work on building multifamily housing. Um, within our group, we do have some other Jewish agencies that are housing developers, affordable housing developers in Milwaukee and in Montreal. So it is an area that there are some Jewish agencies involved, not a lot. Um, and the conversation really is around how difficult it is to obtain the funding necessary and how critical the need is out there for additional um, affordable housing. And so um, to look at ways to advocate for additional federal funding um, to, um, you know, try to advocate for the, you know, the funding that there is to really be directed to nonprofit developers and to also then look at some creative and innovative new models. Um, so an, an area that um, really kind of touches the capital and the services piece is the home repair, um, renovation, modification. So um, Chai has two programs that work in this space. One, uh, we have an acquisition rehab program where we're buying vacant homes and renovating and, and reselling to, um, to homeowners. It's really important to have a nonprofit developer doing this because we are gonna renovate to a quality that really will preserve the home and be a safe place for the new homeowner to come into and to really work within the community where we are to develop um, homeowners for opportunity. Um, and the other area modification, we work with seniors who, um, who are senior or homeowners and need some help maintaining their home um, we are a trusted source, so we're helpful in avoiding scams and, um, you know, feeling comfortable kind of reaching out to us so that they are able to maintain their home and stay in it. We also have a focus on falls prevention, so really to make sure that, um, you know, the housing is safe for them. And when you look at kind of housing services versus brick, bricks and mortar, it is an easier on-ramp for uh, agencies that, that are human services agencies that aren't used to being in the developer space. So um, that is that is kind of um, important to point out that there are those easier ways to get involved. Another way that we've talked about a lot in the uh, work group is housing counseling. Um, so Chai is a, a HUD certified housing counseling agency. Um, and, and the other agencies in the work group are involved in case management and 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 we're making referrals sometimes to housing counseling agencies but not doing the work themselves there is a huge need in the community for more housing counseling it's a specialized area and it, it, it's a space that when people you know may need help on navigating their mortgage and their options they really can't it's so complicated it's just they really can't navigate on their own they need that specialized assistance um, and this really is a can be a complementary specialty for a Jewish human services agency that's already doing case management to really get kind of certified and add the specialty. Um, and the last thing I want to talk about is advocacy. So we spent a lot of time in our work group talking about advocacy. I mean, that's part of what is great about coming together with like-minded agencies. You can speak with a louder voice. Um, and that's so much of the work I know that is done at the, the network um, under Ruben's leadership. Um, so we focus advocacy in a few areas. One, more funding is always needed, both public and private, for, for additional affordable housing. Two, um, considering internet as a utility, as a housing utility, it's critically important that internet is able to be built in to the operating budget of, of housing so that we can make it available to everyone who lives there. Three, of course, always fair housing and just paying attention to compliance with the Fair Housing Act. And then the bigger picture of housing equity. Um, and we had a really interesting conversation about redlining and the effects of the lingering effects of redlining and how the Jewish community used to be subject to those effects and really has kind of gotten out from under it. Um, and that the group really felt strongly that, you know, in order for us to be good um, members of the general community, that we ought to um, help erase the, the lingering effects really of redlining in black and brown communities 
Um, and, and I should point out that the agencies in the group really, and Ruben could speak to this, um, point out that most Jewish human service agencies do see themselves as serving the general community and that's a big part of their mission. And so the group felt strongly that we ought to use our collective voices to advocate for housing equity. Terrific, thank you, Lisa. Um, so great bridge um, to, to bring in Jenny as well. Jenny, we're looking forward to hearing about the, the, the model project that you're working on um, uh, in Rochester, uh, that JFS Rochester is working on. Um, and I know you're also partnering, um, so let's, so we can kind of move to the, the next piece as well. But we'd love to hear your overall thoughts and um, how it's going on the ground, and then um, your thoughts on the partnership. Okay, sounds great. Thank you so much for having me here today. Um, I'm excited to tell you about how Jewish Family Service of Rochester is addressing housing insecurity through a three year pilot study involving the delivery of holistic programming, as we're calling it, at the Rochester Highlands, which, as Eddie was talking about, is an affordable housing complex here in Rochester, New York. This program is part of a collaborative relationship. It's sort of all intertwined there, Susan. Is all is that that's fine. I'll just touch on both. Um, the collaborative relationship that was formed between the Happy Foundation, which Jane is going to talk about, Alliance Strategic, the Konar Foundation, which is a philanthropic foundation here in Rochester, New York, and Jewish Family Service of Rochester. We hypothesized at the, at the beginning of this pilot study that through innovative holistic programming, which included case and resource management, on-site nursing, exercise instruction, educational opportunities, and the formation of a resident council, that we would have a positive impact on residents' sense of community thereby minimizing the transient nature of this population, as well as such factors as depression, obesity, and other social determinants of health. We also offer, at, as part of this programming, Jewish programming. JFS Rochester already were serving a number of clients residing at the Rochester Highlands. And so as a piece of this, we are offering Jewish programming that though it's targeted or designed for those Jewish clients residing there, all are welcome to attend. And but the vast majority of all the events we've had, especially pre-COVID, um, we were getting a, a significant proportion of Jewish clients versus and non-Jewish clients. And some of that programming included Shabbat dinners, um, transportation to synagogue, um, a shofar making kit for children at the complex. Um, so just some different things that we were doing on the Jewish front. Our resource managers there at the complex and all of our staff there for that matter, refer residents to other resources that we at JFS offer. So our food pantry, for example, we have a free clothing store. Um, we have a literacy program for children, which now is being offered virtually there at the complex as well. Um, so we're referring within our agency as well as to resources within the greater Rochester community. Um, some of our challenges, first and foremost, here we are in year two, uh, the start of year two of a pilot study where we're trying to build community and we're living in the age of a global pandemic. Um, and so trying to create community in the age of COVID is tricky, um, though I am very impressed and I'm happy to talk later about some of the ways in which we're doing that. So definitely we've pivoted in terms of the, the, the rollout of some of our programming and a lot of it is virtual at this point. Um, and also, I would say, um, really making sure that we're all aligned in terms of our values. Um, we're dealing with owners of a property, a management company, a foundation that offers programming, and a social service agency. Our goal is to create um, a sense of community, right? We want these residents to want to stay there, to find home, to make it less transient, but also recognizing that Residents need to pay rent in order to employ management companies in order to pay the owners and to keep the property up. And so really aligning values between sort of corporate America and social service America has been, I would say, a challenge. And at the same respect, one that we have all willingly engaged in and had some really hard but incredibly valuable conversations 
that truthfully I believe is what's sustaining us and keeping us going and believing wholeheartedly in this process. But as we've said to each other a number of times, like this is the work, this is why it's hard. Um, otherwise everyone else would be doing this right off the bat. So those are some of where um, the, the challenge or the work has been. Um, but I will tell you that the, the rewards of such work is, is tremendous. Listening to the residents talk about their sense of home, their, what it feels like to be coming home to a place where there are resources, where there's help, where someone's willing and greeting them or providing them with Thanksgiving dinner or helping to empower them so that they don't need Thanksgiving dinner next year. Um, whatever the case may be that, that the rewards um, have far outweighed the work as far as I'm concerned, but, um, but the work remains ongoing. And so those would be the, the few things that I would touch on before we get to get going into more depth. Thank you. Great, terrific, Jenny. Um, and Jane, that tees you up perfectly. Tell us about the Happy Foundation, not only some of the work you're doing, but also just sort of the mindset and the philosophy um, that you bring to it. So Happy Foundation primarily works with Eddie's company in terms we found that it was too hard. It's hard enough to find, it's hard enough to actually work with any landlord, even my husband, let alone to find someone we don't know, which I think is what most of you would find out there. How do you find the landlord? How do you find the cooperative building to work with? Um, which I think Eddie can address that. But we basically go in and survey the residents. That's the very first thing we do with Jenny and Happy Acts is sort of a liaison between the management and these different silos that Ruben was referring to. You really have got people, their job is to lease and to keep the place clean. And then you've got people doing social service and they don't always go together. So Happy's in there to be that buffer for both sides. Um, Happy's main issue and, and um, goal is health, um, which that could be mental health, phys physical health. We have um, walking paths at every property. We really try. We set up walking clubs. We have gardens and we do gardening workshops. We've had after school programs. Um, and again, we cater to the needs of what the actual residents need and what they um, desire. Um, it, it comes, every area is different. There's different geographies. We have different properties and we don't always have a JFS Rochester which is what would be great to have that level of social service agency. Sometimes Happy will go in on their own and set up the programming. Um, it comes down to the basic needs of, of residents. And as Eddie was saying, there's no more cost-effective or convenient way to reach these underserved population, right at the doorsteps, right at the community rooms, Jenny brings in food, Jenny brings in clothing. And we are a very um, cooperative, interested landlord. We participate financially, both the landlord does, Eddie's side, and so does Happy. Um, so Happy's always you know, funding and trying to help. And then we've got Jenny. So it really takes a collaboration, as Jenny was saying, between the property, between an agency and the donor, all with the need. So it is doable. You're out there thinking, where do I start? But it, it really is. You say, what is your community? There's a question right here. There's someone in the Bay Area who would like to know, well, where do I start? And um, I think that is, I think that where we should lead to now is how you really can bring this to your community. Great. So this was um, a flyby through incredible number of thousands, thousands of hours of work um, and set up. Um, so what I thought we would do now, um, we do have a couple questions in the chat. Um, what I thought we would do now before we move to those is just give you all a chance to ask each other some questions and to sort of pick up on some themes that, um, that the others raised. Because there are so many different places where there's intermingling. Certainly the philosophy of sort of bringing residents into the decision-making process, not only as advisors, but also really kind of as um, with full sort of dignity and 
and awareness um, of their role and their rightful role in determining um, the living environment. Um, another one that I heard was about sort of collaboration is difficult and, and complicated, but sort of the alignment of values um, is really important and sort of then playing those out on the ground um, is, is challenging, but that's that's where the work is. Um, and certainly sort of the, the range of issues that we've that we've heard um, for, for this population in particular. So I would love to sort of start to pick up on a couple of these. Do do any do any of you want to start? I can call on someone, but if any of you want to start and pick up on um, on, on a comment, that would be that would be terrific. So so I'd love to jump in, Jenny. Putting you on the spot, I'm interested in having you unpack a bit about the comment that you made about sort of the collaboration that you develop with the property owner. Um, and when you think about yourself as a social service agency representing clients, but you're also there representing the property owner. So, and the client has a right to self-determination. So how do you navigate all of that? Who are you? Who, who, who is your client really? Um, and how do you navigate those relationships? Yeah, thanks Ruben. No, uh, great question. Look, our clients for sure, first and foremost, are the residents that we're serving over at affordable housing. And I think part of why this has worked even the hard conversations is because Jane and Eddie have gotten that from the start and like have understood that whether there have been times, um, you know, COVID with um, a moratorium on evictions for a period of time, and it's varied from state to state, um, but also recognizing the number of residents who have struggled to keep employment during that time or who have struggled because they know that come the end of COVID or come the end of, end of this moratorium will be receiving eviction notices. That's like a great example of conver uh, hard conversations that we had. I'm saying we when I'm talking about Jane, Eddie, and I, as well as quite frankly, the management company at some point was also involved and our staff. Who are, who are working so hard to try to work with the residents on what are their rights? What are their responsibilities? How can we work on something like, let's talk about um, whether it's employment post COVID, whether it's financial literacy, whether it's resume building, whether it's, and how do we navigate with Jane and Eddie and figuring out, is there some leeway where we can give them some wiggle room to allow for preparation so that they're not just getting evicted because of the circumstances of our society. And so those, I guess, you know, I have no real clear cut answer other than saying we've all shown up for the conversations and we've all compromised, I, I would say, and Jane and Eddie, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we have all compromised in order to make sure that everyone's needs are being met, but first and foremost, that those residents feel like they've been on the part of JFS at least, advocated for and are receiving the supports that would be entailed in a grant that's supposed to be there in order to help them. Um, but it's a great it's a great question. And do you guys want to add anything, Jane or Eddie? I could add that, you know, because it's a pilot, we're all learning as we go and everyone's learning sort of what their roles are. Um, there's history behind a resident and that's what management comes out and is explaining. Um, and Jenny has offered financial, because uh, you also have other resources. So you've been able to redirect them. So it's kind of like all of us need to know the facts and with the right caring heart um, and, and uh, opportunities, we've been able to mostly help the people um, stay. That same, stay. Yeah, and also being on the same team, basically. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Eddie, you're muted. Eddie, you're muted. The irony is that when you have the, um, the compulsion to get people to, what am I trying to say? Fair housing oftentimes has become an issue. Whereas if you don't offer it to, you can't offer it to just one section of the property, you have to offer it to all. Um, if I could just jump in on this topic from just like from our, my point of view as well. I mean, it's so interesting, I think, the way um, in JFS Rochester, you, you and in your collaboration with um, Eddie and Jane that you've set up a model that um, is working within sort of like the existing apartment building um, and to bring those kinds of services that really kind of reflects the type of model that you see 
in affordable housing in, in, in HUD properties and in tax credit communities as well. Um, and there's a, a big part of what we say there is that um, our communities all have service coordinators so that there are there is um, staff at the building that really kind of are there to help the residents navigate whatever comes up. Um, and it is helpful to have them on the same kind of team as the property management staff because issues that come up in housing, they're not linear. You know, so you've got like an issue that that a resident is dealing with that may seem like a service issue, but it creeps into their use of their unit, which becomes a property issue. And so it really does take everyone coming together um, as a team to to be able to kind of collaboratively and creatively problem solve. So um, I just want to commend you for for putting together this model that um, that it's working within existing bricks and mortar. I mean, we Yes, we do need to build more units. There's not enough affordable housing. And also we need to find ways to kind of build this, this type of um, services, you know, with existing um, communities that are out there. Thanks. Great. Lisa. That was a great kickoff question. Um, Jenny, you have the you have got the ball. Um, is there anyone you want to bring in with a question? I was just, I was going to ask maybe Jane or Eddie to speak to a little bit here. I think it would be helpful to hear how they deal with managing the operations in the community. Um, you know, because they, you know, they, the management is often the intermediary, right? Like, and so I just think that that would be an interesting piece to hear about. Eddie, can you hear, or you want me to take it? Go ahead. I, I didn't hear the question. I'm so sorry. Okay, yeah. Um, you're asking how do we deal with, how do all three of us deal with management? Um, Carefully. We have, <laughs> we have weekly calls and a lot of communication and we are definitely setting up protocols. Um, and the truth is that's where happy really needs to come in because the less management is involved, the better, because again, that's not their job. Um, and they need to stay focused on what they're doing. They need to be supportive and cooperative, which is where we keep them in line that way. And then we also are helping navigate that because they're really two different. But um, management, when you and, you, and you, you, all management's different. You can get one manager who's really interested personally and another who's like, this is a headache. So um, I think you need the right player in between to make that work. Well, it's like all social service of endeavors everyone has to be committed and uh they want to help and it's work like we've all been saying nothing's easy but to get great results it needs collaboration and it needs uh, a political will and and social will so you know that's if there's not a, a willingness to cooperate and compromise then it's not going to work and that's the challenge not everybody is as philanthropic or as um interested in making a difference that's the challenge so you got to find the right people i have a question which would be to eddie which i think most people would want to know out there just like the person asked about san francisco can you just elaborate a little bit more it was lucky that jenny found us but how would you wherever they're sitting in their markets find um you know okay. a partner such as us that's a great question so Housing authorities are in every single county. They are the ones who certify and look at the rents. They audit to make sure that, you know, everything is based, and maybe it's important to explain that area median income is how all the rents are tagged. And maybe we went too fast, but so let's say a area median income is hundred grand in a certain submarket, like it is probably in Northern California. And nobody should pay more than 30% of their annual salaries. So let's say someone makes 50 grand or they make 50% of area median income. So they shouldn't pay more than 15,000 or 30% of the 50,000 if you follow per year. That's really inexpensive. So that's why it's a very safe investment because people are, they never tend to be vacant because the rent's so cheap. If you're paying so little, you know, 1200 a month for an apartment in San Francisco Bay area is pretty, pretty good. So these housing authorities are the ones who are making sure that you're not charging more than the max allowable rents according to whatever that area median income level is. So 
But that being said, they're in there constantly. The housing authorities of each county know which landlords like us are more forward, are more interested, are more philanthropic, are willing to make a difference beyond just collecting rent. And that's where I would start is the housing authority, wherever you are in each county, they know who the good landlords are, so to speak. That's probably the simplest way I can say it. Otherwise, there's there's all kinds of ways to, you know, network. I'm happy to help anybody who wants to find because we we are in a division of a national LIHTC low income housing tax credit syndicator, and we have about 100,000 units in 47 states. So we know who the good operators are and we're happy to introduce if we're not in that location. Great. So we want to spend the next 20 minutes or so uh, pulling in questions from the chat and the Q&A. Um, and I think they really do build on some of the comments that we've just made. Um, let me note a couple of the themes. There was one set of questions around the demographics of residents and um, specifically what kinds, so it was some specifics around the, the um, buildings themselves and utility allowances. There were some questions about building community in a time of COVID and pandemic um, and distancing. Um, when travel on buses to concerts and museums are no longer possible, community rooms are closed. Um, and then there was a set of questions about getting, you know, sort of linking best practices in different cities together, um, Bay Area, Montreal. Um, so we'll get to, we'll probably get to that one at the end. Um, and then some questions about um, advocacy at the national level. So why don't we start with that last one, the advocacy at the state and federal level? Um, I think that started, Eddie, you almost started to go down that road a little bit with sort of how do you work with the state agencies. But if we can kind of pull back to advocacy in particular, that might be sort of a place to start, especially since you know, I think everyone's looking to January and um, you know the, the moratorium. Uh, and so maybe one of you, if you're kind of in the middle of that set of conversations or, um, or concerns, maybe you can start us off. It's a complicated question. Probably, you know, if every jurisdiction has its own uh, moratoriums and their own norms, and it's a matter of cooperating with people. We're, we were just able to start eviction proceedings on people pre-COVID, you know, and now we're trying to make plans to work that out. But now everything I find, at least in Rochester, I think, is now till the end of March. So, you know, landlords are uptight. It's frustrating because a lot of people are taking advantage of the system, specifically in PG County. We're doing really well across the country, but in Washington, D.C. suburbs, D the district and Fr Prince George's County seem to be a, a more entitled crew. And so uh, we are very frustrated. Our collections are down in the 65, 70% range, whereas even in Las Vegas, we're at 90%. So uh, it, it's such a complex item that the only thing we can hope for is we get a good transition, I'm being nice, to this new presidency and all the things and the norms that used to be are able to jump in. Biden's plan is mostly about vouchers. And if we had vouchers for every single struggling human, that would be the key to all of this. Now, what does a voucher do? It's important to say, vouchers don't pay people's rent. They only pay the difference between that 30% of what they can afford to pay and the difference. That, that's helpful, especially since the question was around sort of federal and state subsidies and, um, you know, sort of development incentives is particularly challenging. Susan, could I jump in? Yeah, I'm sorry. Lisa, please go ahead. Could I jump in on advocacy? Sorry, I think I may have a time delay. Um, I just want, I wanted to uh, jump in sort of on the big picture, kind of the federal and state advocacy, because it is something that we're talking about in the working group. And um, we do need to um, do advocacy on a number of levels. So, um, you know, to when, when we're talking about money, capital dollars, so, so that that those that money primarily comes from the federal government, from the from HUD and from um, tax credits, and we need to speak with a louder voice to advocate for more dollars, um, so that there can be additional units of housing. We know that there are not enough units of housing across. Um, communities all across the country. So that is, is one piece of, of it. And then I think, you know, when we're talking about vouchers, um, as Eddie was talking about before he got cut off, it is so critically important because it, as he was saying, focuses on actual affordability. I recently was in a conversation where somebody said, 
what is affordable housing? And it's and they meant it really as the big picture question that it sounds like. And you know, affordable, and I answered it much the way Eddie was talking about, affordable housing is about, uh, it's personalized. It is about the person's budget. And it's about housing not taking up more of the budget than its kind of rightful place so that there is room for food and for medicine and for all of the other services that people need. Um, so that's really key. And the one other point I just wanted to make about sort of the moratorium, um, you know, the evictions and also um, kind of foreclosures is that one key element, now we're sort of on the services side, one key element to keep in mind is that housing counseling and working with, with, um, with residents on um, uh, navigating their particular housing um, situation really can vary and it is about creating a livable situation. And sometimes the answer is, yeah, this house is not affordable to you anymore. And then the best solution really is to work on an exit plan that creates the right kind of landing. And that could you know, be in an apartment if someone's in an apartment that they can't afford or in a home. And sometimes the best solution is to help um, you know, transition, uh, help the person transition to more affordable housing. Good. And advocacy is a big topic. We could probably spend the whole time on that one. I do want to get to some of the other questions as well. There was a set of questions about the demographics that you serve. Um, and so maybe just Lisa and Jenny on this one, um, you can just explain the demographics that you serve, um, a practical legal way to ensure a publicly funded low income housing facility can remain largely, if not all Jewish a question about the programs and services provided to those in surrounding areas. So just a number of ways to ask the question of, of who of the resident, um, the resident population. So Jenny, maybe you can start and then Lisa. Yes, so uh, you know, I did mention that we have Jewish clients living at the Rochester Highlands. Legally, we can't ask, and Eddie can speak more about fair housing and what we're allowed to ask and not allowed to ask in terms of religion. Um, but we, you know, we've often at JFS discussed like Jewish affordable housing, for example. But that the creation of that or finding that we haven't found that as an option. What we found is that there are first of all, we found a significant need in Rochester for Jewish uh, for of Jewish individuals needing affordable housing. Um, but the creation of a place that's just Jewish affordable housing is not a possibility. So we are serving our clients where, you know, we're meeting those Jewish residents, you know, where they are living at the Rochester Highlands. We know that there are other Jewish individuals in Rochester who are living in other affordable housing um, units and places that we are also serving. Um, but we, this happens to be where we're offering this holistic programming. Um, but in terms of like the percentage, I mean, even though we're serving a number of Jewish clients there, it's still a very, it's a small percentage of the clients that are there. Um, and th those that have volunteered the information and told us that they're Jewish, we have that information. But again, legally, we can't, we can't get, collect that. Um, so in terms of, I mean, in terms of other demographics, we have a large number of children at the, the complex. Um, I think it's close to, Jane, you might correct me, but I think we're close to 200 under the age of 18. Um, and we also have a, a good, a decent size of old, a population of older adults at the complex. It's really a widespread community in terms of ages that we're, we're seeing there. Also, um, other demographics that I would add with regards to, I mean, and I guess I would also just add that other places that we're seeing some of our clients from JFS also, um, while there's one site that has more seniors, I would for sure say, though it's not deemed senior affordable housing, um, there, there is another site where it is more focused, heavily focused on um, aging adults. Um, Lisa, were you going to add to that? Um, I, I mean, I really could probably just echo um, what you said, um, Jenny. We we, um, we don't we actually don't even ask um, at all or retain any information about religion of of um, our residents. So I, I actually couldn't even give you a good guess. Um, and I think that that's it's. In, I'm glad that the question was asked because I think it's really kind of an uh, interesting point to make about working in the housing space that it is. Um, it is sort of by definition sort of work in the general community, um, you know, partially because uh, or maybe largely because, you know, we're taking um, federal dollars, but also really that's just kind of what the work is about. Um, so it's just sort of interesting to note 
um, that we have in terms of, of age, we, our housing is mostly senior housing. And that is really because that's the funding we went after. So that, you know, the funding is designated typically towards the population. Um, there's a lot, I think, more funding now towards family housing and intergenerational, as Jenny was mentioning. And so that's kind of a, that's a direction that we are, are going to be going in. I could just interject and say, as the landlord, we do know the demographics of our uh, communities and we do provide that um, based on fair housing, what we're allowed to ask to the companies that we work with. So we know there's a lot of single moms. We know the ages and the breakdowns of all the kids and stuff like that. Okay. And, and same with the demographic theme, I would just mention if we go back to advocacy, the, because we know these communities serve different types of communities, this is the perfect platform to engage with coalition partners outside of the Jewish community who share the exact same concerns about affordable housing and figuring out in your state or your region, are there housing coalition advocacy efforts underway that you representing a Jewish agency could sign on to and be part of. I think it would send an incredibly strong statement um, in, as we continue to find ways to support the full community. Uh, there's a set of questions. Let me encourage the panelists to just take a peek at the Q&A and the chat since there are some pretty specific questions in there about um, specific services, um, specific questions about like, uh, um, I think we covered demographics, um, but just a couple of the other the links to your project. So if you wouldn't mind just spending a moment peeking through and responding to both the chat and the Q&A. So I just saw one I could just kind of jump in um, sure. while we're reading, um, which is such an important question. What are you doing for activities when community rooms are closed? Um, it's such an important question. So um, yeah, our community rooms have been closed since March. Uh, we actually, you know, over the summer, we're starting to talk about how we could get them reopened because looking ahead to what's going to be a long winter um, where people are not going to be able to get out and, um, you know, and see friends and see family outside safely. Um, and so we were kind of proactively looking down the road and now, you know, there's spikes, like crazy spikes. And we're back to thinking it's not going to be practical. Um, and so I, where I actually pulled my team together for a brainstorm, like, guys, we have got to get really creative here. We do have activities directors that, uh, in addition to the service coordinators at many of our um, communities. And, you know, they've been going around trying to engage in some activities on individual basis and dropping off, you know, um, various like packages and things like that. And, and, you know, dressing in costume and having balloons and talking to people outside the windows and that kind of thing. But I think that this, um, this winter is going to present a unique challenge. And, um, and actually, I'm going to loop into this other question about Wi Fi. So, you know, many of our, um, especially our older people that we're serving in the community who have Wi Fi, we're doing a lot of virtual programming. Well, in our, um, in our affordable housing communities, many, many people do not have Wi-Fi. And, and that is really the reason behind that advocacy. And so we have got to get creative in ways to engage people um, safely and, and without the internet. So um, sort of stay tuned on that. And not that I have an answer, but I just wanted to highlight it as a really, really critical question. That's great. Can check there, the next? Yeah, please. So I can take the question on the, uh, we've done, Besides the hotel conversions, we actually converted an office building down in uh, Orange County uh, to affordable workforce housing, whereas uh, it's kind of unique because there are 14 foot clear ceilings with views and very few high rise apartments. So the whole adaptive reuse concept is really exciting. In Northern California, we're working on a mall that is closed and we are going to be integrating a ton of units to surround the existing retail. So there's a lot of opportunities to create not only workforce housing, as we say, between 80 and 120 percent of area median, area median income, excuse me, but uh, not only for affordable housing as well. So there's all kinds of creative shifts that are happening as a result of this um, this pandemic that's creating ways for us to create affordable housing. And so I think there was another question about PG County. PG County is uh, Prince George's County. And so 
every county has a different moratorium and or hand, way of handling evictions. So the uh, what, what my mention was there about the tenants tend to be gathering and collecting. Even though they have the money, they're not paying as fast as, say, other jurisdictions in the country. I, I hope that answers the question more clearly. Good. All right. We are entering the last five or six minutes um, of the hour. As Ruben promised, we are only touching the tip of the tip of the iceberg. Um, and Lisa, I just want to um, reiterate uh, thanks to you for leading um, the affinity group subgroup that's working on these questions. Um, in a moment, I'd love to ask each of the panelists just to kind of give us their kind of headline as they think about, we're now in the middle of November, sort of what the next six months are gonna look like, what it is that we should really be paying attention to um, out, of, out of this conversation and just sort of in the, in the environment. Um, but in the meantime, I just wanna let folks know that um, the Affinity Group is continuing to discuss many of these issues um, from advocacy to best practices, to um, supporting um, different cities and sharing as, as they try to stand up new initiatives. Um, service delivery, um, choices around demographics. So many of the things that have been mentioned in the chat um, are, are things that are live discussions in that group. So we will take, there were probably two, two very specific questions in the chat we didn't quite get to. So I will send those to the, um, to the panelists and if they have an answer, um, they will be able to get back to you as an individual um, after this. But let me, let me sort of pause here um, and give our panelists a few minutes just to kind of reflect on on, um, on kind of what's popping to mind for you as we as we close out this hour and enter the end of 2020, um, thank goodness, and the beginning of 2021. <laughs> um, Jenny, why don't we start with you and then um, Lisa and then Jane and Eddie and then Ruben. As I see it, as Lisa said, we have a long winter ahead of us. I know in Rochester, the projection is that one in every 10 households will get an eviction notice by the end of um, by the end of this moratorium. So one in 10. But I know that sadly, there are so many communities around our country that are facing terribly staggering and scary statistics as well around housing. And I guess I would just end with that we have a lot of work to do. This is the start. It's a work in progress. There are trials and tribulations and lots of benefits. I have an, you know, I'm grateful for an incredibly dedicated staff and incredibly dedicated team that's willing to work together and for all everyone to show up. But this is the work that needs to be done. Truly, this community deserves our efforts and our time. And um, that's what I would leave with. And thank you for having me here today. Truly. Great. Lisa? Great, thank you. Yes, thank you so much for the opportunity. It's just so great to um, be able to have this conversation and to share the stage with the, um, this group of panelists. So, I mean, I, I think that that headline, I mentioned it before, but it's worth mentioning again, is just um, the, the focus, the sharpened focus that the pandemic has put on housing. Um, you know, we have seen that having a safe uh, place to be is uh, you know is just more critical than ever, especially now. And it's not just safety, but it's well-being. Um, and so it's really kind of taking a holistic look at you know people's experience um, in, in general, and and then specifically during the pandemic. And I think like we've we've had this opportunity to highlight you know some bigger and and maybe more manageable ways to get involved in housing. I mean, I just think you know I hope that this is kind of a call to action. Um, for, for people listening to, um, to really kind of take a good look at housing and the many ways that you might be able to get involved in making a difference in, in creating housing security in the communities um, that you live in. And, um, and, and for us, we need to think about what an opportunity, you know, as, as Ruben mentioned, an opportunity it presents for us to, you know, be good partners in the communities where you know, where we live and, and work and serve. Thank you um, very much for your patience with my technology and, and the phone. I really appreciate that. I just want to reiterate how all the foundations out there can get involved. There are many ways, both in program-related investments where you can help fund and support and build housing that's not able to be built at uh, more of a lower market interest rate. And there's market rate investments, which which investors can get a, a market rate return and make a difference to preserve affordable housing and keep housing from going out to market because oftentimes it's a very defensive play and our rents are all maybe as low as 
or as high as $500 below market. And as a result, it's very safe and people are very, very uh, keen to stay because they got a good deal. And then the third area is, of course, grants like the Conar Foundation gave to Jewish Funders Network and Jewish Family Service, which is really important. And there's also one other area I'd like to float out there. There's oftentimes two, three hundred dollars worth of rent that make the difference between us housing someone and not in terms of making the numbers work. Because remember, we still have investors and we all have to answer to people. So it's not, you know, we all have someone to answer to. So if there's a way that foundations can get involved and maybe do some supplemental vouchers and help bridge the gap between what people can afford and what the market rents truly are, it could be a hundred, two hundred dollars, and if you multiply that by uh, fifty units, it could be as low as a fifty thousand dollar grant, which could be arranged to make sure that a lot of people get housed. So, once again, thank you to all, Jenny. You're doing a magnificent job, and we're blessed to have you uh, work in this pilot with us. And 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 Eric Rubin, thanks for your help. And Jane, my partner in crime, nice to be with you. Jane, anything to add on that from your perspective? Well, I just want to thank Ruben and Jenny and uh, everybody on the call. I think it's uh, great. I think we're all here to help make this become a reality in your markets. I know like Ruben opened this by saying how daunting it is. Um, it is something you can get your hands around. It's um, we're setting a stage of how you can do that. Um, and so privately offline, we'd love to explore that with you. Yes, and this idea of investable opportunities, um, just to, sort of taking a big, big problem. And as each of you have mentioned, really sort of saying, what is it that we can do on the ground to make a difference, even in a big, intractable, um, terrifying and important problem? Um, there just there is forward motion. So it's fantastic to hear each of you um, give us that. So Ruben, um, give us your sense as we as we wrap this up. So I'm just going to take us all back to the beginning. First, I do want to thank Lisa, Jane, Eddie, Jane, uh, Jenny, Susan. This is an important conversation to have. Um, this is a scary conversation to have. This does take many of us out of our comfort zone. Uh, and so I think this is about culture change. And I think that we can find a way if, if we find, if we acknowledge the incredible role that housing plays to support stability for a family and stability for a community, then each of us have a role in that continuum. Um, and we want to be your thought partners in helping you navigate this uh, locally in your communities. So thank you for giving us this forum to begin this conversation. Fantastic, fantastic. And I, I just want to end on the note of how terrific it is, how many times um, has been it's mentioned, really engaging the residents as full owners and partners um, in the decision making and the discussion because um, they are the ones who are experiencing this um, real time and sort of working with people who are as proximate to the problem as they are um, is just so critical. And, and this really does sort of help um, create not only better outcomes, but, but the true community, I think, that, um, that so many of us want to build um, and that we need. So thank you all very much for the work you have done every day you're, you're about to do. And thank you for being here. So Tamar, can you wrap us up? Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you all so much. I can't believe we're just at the hour and I can't believe the amount of information that was shared today and the amount of wisdom that was shared. So thank you to all of the, all the panelists for the work that you do every day and for coming to us so graciously and sharing this information to try to make this big issue more bite-sized and help people think about it in different ways. Thank you to all the participants um, who, who logged on today and and joined us and we look forward to continuing to learn again like i said at the start in january at the start of 2021 we are going to start another series of of webinars on a lot of different um, important information uh, and so look out for your emails for more information about that in the coming weeks and we really look forward to continuing this this learning and this work together thank you all stay well <laughs>